Praise the Lord this morning, folks. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's worship the King of Kings and the Lord of glory this morning. Amen. Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Come and worship you this morning. Have your way this morning, Lord. I was walking the wayside. Lord. Lost on a lonely road. Chasing the highlight, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in, crying like the rain. Then I saw life in forever, never been the same.
so excited and emotional <laughs> oh I ask you why ain't you excited <laughs> hallelujah oh praise God I, I tell you, you got a, 
a guest this morning going to share, but I got a word that the Lord is burning in my heart for next week. <laughs> Amen. Oh, hallelujah. The kind of God I serve. Oh, I don't know about you, the God I serve, church, there's no limit. <laughs> That's right. Amen. I said there's no limit right. to what he can do in your life this morning. Amen. Yeah. And we believe that this morning. Come on, one more time. Give the Lord praise tonight. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. When we know the authority of the name of Jesus, let's believe this morning in the have faith in his power this morning not our power but we stand upon the hand of christ in our life amen, amen. let's go to the throne room of heaven right now lord heavenly father we come to you this morning lord god i pray and ask that you would minister to these needs today lord you know those that are battling cancer lord what they're dealing with in their lives lord you know those who are god god with, with infirmities in their body we come this morning in the name of Christ. Lord, every name that's been called. Lord, every name on our prayer list. God, you're well able this morning. God, to do greater things that we can even comprehend. Lord, God, I pray that you would move, Lord. God, that you would touch these lives. Lord, let the power of your presence reign as we come together in the name of Jesus. We come together in the name of that is above every name. Lord God, move in the house this morning. Lord God, move on behalf of those in the hospital. Lord, of those Lord in rehab. God, move on their behalf this morning. But God, we stand in the gap. Lord, we stand this morning believing. Lord, every unspoken need. Lord, across the sanctuary. God, reveal yourself in their lives. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise and glory. We give you the praise this morning, Lord. God, have your way right now. Right now, Lord Jesus, loose your presence in this house. God, reveal yourself, I pray. Come on, saints of God, give him praise. Come on, give him love this morning. Let him know that you love him. Let him know that you thank him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. God, have your way this morning in this house. Jesus, we give you glory. Come on. Glory. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Salve! 
Yeah. 
set me free That's what your mercy did for me Lord, you found me, you healed me, you called me from the grave. You gave me a real love, I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Now I am living like I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Glory, glory, glory. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I say unto you, yes, unto you. Think it not strange, think it not impossible that I am able in your situation to set at liberty. I am able, stronger, if you believe, stand in me and I will reveal my hand of glory in you. I will reveal my hand of glory among my people that they might see and not doubt to know that I am the one that has done that work in you. Know that I will do that which is thought impossible. Go. Go in me and proclaim I will do what I have promised, saith the Lord. Glory. Glory. Come on, church. Come on. Give it praise in the house this morning. Come on. Give God praise in the house this morning. Glory. Glory. Come on. What are you going for this morning? What is it that you need God to do in your life this morning? Let Him do the work. Let God be glorified in your life. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He spoke those words to Moses and the children of Israel. As they stood with their back against the wall, as it were. But the scripture says he opened that water up. As it were, a wall divided that they might walk through on dry ground. Not possible in the eyes of man. But with God, all things are possible to them that believe. Are you believing in Him this morning? Put it in the hands of the Lord. Let Christ, let Him be glorified in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. He's worthy this morning, church. Worthy. Hallelujah. Glory. Wash my sins away. 
say thank you Jesus thank you Jesus oh he is wonderful wonderful savior can you say amen to that this morning amen. glory to God God bless you this morning I want brother McKenzie to come just take his liberty in the Lord come on give him a good pound for us welcome this morning sweet presence of God in this place this morning. Can I just, um, I just want to honor the Lord this morning and thank you all for having us. But um, can I just pray before, before I open up this morning? Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to stand in this pulpit and represent your kingdom and to represent U.S. missions. God, I pray this morning as I share your heart, Lord, I pray that you would stir hearts in this place, God, that we would see the United States as a mission field, that we wouldn't see just foreign missions and sending missionaries overseas, but God, that we would see the lost in our land and that we would see the prodigals, Lord. I pray that you would grip us again with a spirit of prayer and intercession for those that are lost and wondering. God, I pray that you make this a missions house, God. Lord, I pray that you bring in the harvest into this church. God, that this church would be known as a place of revival, not just a place of stirring within us, God, but a place of commissioning and sending out into the streets, God, even in this community, God. Lord, as they begin to reach out and, and do things like this outreach, whether it be a thousand people, God, I pray, Lord, that you stir in that place, God, open doors of outreach, God, even one-on-one -on -one connection with individuals, that there would be a harvest come into this church and into your kingdom, God. I thank you for U.S. missions, and I thank you for your heart, Lord, for the lost. I pray that it be evident today. God, come and speak through me, God. Come and rest on every word that comes out of my mouth. Let it be as if you're holding the microphone this morning, Jesus. Speak to us. Give us ears to hear and give us eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. My name is Garrett McKenzie. This is my lovely wife over here. Erica, will you stand up? <laughs> I'm the loud mouth. She's the quiet one. So she's so much sweeter than me. She'll be there to give you all the hugs after service. And, and she'll be here after service if you want to talk to her a little bit. But I want to share with you what God has called us to do this morning. And Pastor, thank you so much for letting me trusting me with your pulpit this morning. God has called us to reach those in the French Quarter in New Orleans and specifically on Bourbon Street with the gospel. A place where there is no church presence up until this point. There is now a church presence on Bourbon Street. God is moving in an incredible way. About four years ago, there was an owner of a bar on Bourbon Street. If you know anything of Bourbon Street, maybe, maybe some of you have never been, it is a line of bars uh, with every block. There's 13 blocks with fortune tellers on every single block. There's a representat representation of the kingdom of darkness everywhere on Bourbon Street, but there is not a representation of the church until now. Amen. About four years ago, this guy named Keith who owned this bar was encountered by uh, a... Um, street evangelist who's now one of our team members in New Orleans. And this evangelist led him to the Lord and he had a radical encounter with God and he said, God, I'll, I'll give up this lifestyle. He was in a very dark party lifestyle, completely gave up that lifestyle, started uh, just saying, God, I'll, I'll use whatever I can just to serve you. And how many of you know that Jesus meets us where we're at? I don't know if any of you have ever just been in complete darkness before, but Jesus meets us where we're at. And so Jesus met Keith where he was at, right there in the midst of that mess on Bourbon Street. And so Keith said, I'll do whatever I can, God, just to, to serve you. I'll lay everything down. I'll use all of my resources. And so he approached the street evangelist and he said, can we host worship inside of the bar on Bourbon? street. Uh -oh. 
<laughs> See the look, you get a big look, right? Of course, evangelists, an evangelist would say, yes, we can host God inside of your bar. So they brought in a worship leader four years ago, and they held a worship service inside of a bar on the 600 block of Bourbon Street. And what happened next was nothing short of a miracle. People began wandering in off of the streets and encountering the power of the Holy Spirit. And one after another, they began to get saved, falling on their knees, things we've read about from the Azusa Street Revival, things we've read about of conviction falling on people's hearts right there on Bourbon Street in an old dirty bar room, people began dropping to their knees and encountering the Lord. One worship service turned into two worship services and it turned into three worship services until now, four years later, I'm telling you that there has been over 200 people that have come to know Jesus on Bourbon Street right there in their old dirty bar room while we experienced some of the worst things the church has seen with COVID and while the church has seen so much defeat and discouragement, can I tell you that Pentecost has been rolling down the street of Bourbon Street and God is moving in revival and awakening in places we didn't expect him all through the ministry of Jesus. The church didn't expect to find him with a woman at the well. They didn't expect to find him with a tax collector and sinner but can I tell you that Jesus Christ is walking the streets of Bourbon Street and he is still meeting the woman at the well. He is still meeting the tax collector in the center. He is meeting them where they are at. God is good. He is faithful. Pentecost is real. <laughs> I don't want to just talk in tongues. I don't want to just have good church services. I want to see the kingdom of darkness plundered. And, and people that are totally in darkness embraced by the love of God and the redemption of God. My wife and I were um, attending one of these worship services. We heard God was moving on Bourbon Street. We didn't know what it was. It was a ministry friend that told us about it. So we traveled to New Orleans. I was pastoring a church. I pastored a church for seven and a half years. Started the church in Panama City Beach. We were attending that worship service. And um, what we witnessed that day was powerful. I watched as people came in on Halloween weekend. Come on. I watched as people came in off the street weeping from the presence of God. I watched this with my own eyes begin to happen. And what happened inside of my heart that day was God began to grip me for a city and for an area that I didn't know he was sending me to. And all of a sudden, that burden for my city in Panama City Beach left. And I began to be gripped in intercession for the city of New Orleans and for Bourbon Street and for the prodigals that are on the streets and for the homeless that are on the streets. And how many of you know that as we begin to host God's presence, even this morning, there is a, a, a piece of God's heart that we capture. We're transformed from glory to glory and strength to strength. We're ever being changed into the image of Christ. And that happens internally. That means that things that I wasn't passionate about that are all in the heart of Jesus for my life, all of a sudden that begins to grip me and I become passionate for the things that Jesus is passionate about. And so I pray that that same spirit is stirred this morning as you behold Jesus. I believe that just as God gripped me in that bar room, that God can grip you right there in your seat as we behold him this morning. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's your grandkids you're believing for. Maybe it's people in your workplace you're believing for. Or that family member but can I tell you that as we behold him and we host his presence we are transformed into the very image and nature of Jesus it's not just that we look like him on the outside it's that we feel like him on the inside we're burdened for the things that he is burdened for so there I was in that old stinky bar room on the 600 block of Bourbon Street you want to know something I, th I think God has a sense of humor um, you know, if nothing else, laugh at me this morning. But I really think he has a sense of humor. Do you want to know what that bar is called? Saints and sinners. <laughs> God would arrest the heart of a bar owner called Saints and Sinners on the 600 block of Bourbon Street. Do you know a, a place on Bourbon Street, an establishment like that, costs $25,000 a month to operate? It's, I don't believe that it's the church doesn't want to go to Bourbon Street. I believe it's not practical for a church to go to Bourbon Street. God had to open a door another way. He had to, and I believe that God will use the enemy's money to fund the kingdom. I, I just believe that he will. I've seen him do it actually. And I, I just, just a, a quick testimony, and, and I know I'm side railing here, but one of my largest mission supporters, actually runs a cult in Costa Rica and it's somebody that I ministered at his cult and ministered to him personally. He was he wasn't he didn't accept Jesus, 
as a savior, but, but he said that uh, I impacted his life to such a degree that he now supports me monthly in missions and believes what I'm doing. I believe that God will use the enemy's finances to fund his kingdom. <laughs> I love what God is doing and, and, and God has burdened us. Uh, he's burdened us inside of that place. Just from there, that burden began to carry over into asking God, what is it that you're asking of us to do? And we've laid down our lives to go to New Orleans. We now oversee what is what was worship services. We now oversee as the Bourbon Street House of Prayer that is established. It is our vision and our goal to establish 24-7 prayer and worship where the clubs blare their music into the streets and people party. We want to blare the kingdom of God into the streets because we're already seeing the fruit of it. But if we can see God uh, align the church and back us into this place. I believe that we can see a harvest that's even greater. I believe that, that 200 people over a span of four years is nothing. I believe that's the first fruit of what we're going to see as we give our lives and lay our lives down for this. God began to grip us, and not only us, but other people inside of that place. If you have any of those pictures, you can kind of stroll in behind me. God began to grip us, and, and not only uh, do we get uh, really quick. That's um, that's from the inside of the up, upstairs of the bar room where we hold services. It's directly across from Marie Laveau's voodoo shop where there's an altar for the enemy. I just kind of wanted to show you where we're set up. We are set up in the devil's territory, but I believe that that land belongs to the Lord. Amen. Will you go to the next slide there? This is uh, our first outreach. I wanted to tell you, um, it wasn't our first, it was one of our first outreaches um, where God began to grip our heart, not only just for the loss that we're wondering in, but for the homeless. If you've been to New Orleans and in the French Quarter at all, you'll see the homeless uh, strung out on drugs and alcohol all across the street. And people are just walking over them and stepping on them as if they don't exist. And I believe that the kingdom of God is also for the least of these. Jesus cared about the poor and he commissions the church to love the poor. And so something that God has burdened my heart for is to not only just love the people that are that, that, that are wandering in and darkness and, and the witches and the fortune tellers and those practitioners of voodoo, but also the poor, those that are overlooked. The last shall be first in the kingdom of God. And we want to know, we want them to know that they are sons and they are daughters of God. That's Smitty right there in the picture. That was our, our that was Easter this past year. We threw Easter for the homeless in Jackson Square. We gave out 120 backpacks so they can carry their supplies on their back. We fed them a hot meal and you can actually see a worship leader, one of our Assembly of God worship leaders in the back on there blaring worship music and people are worshiping all throughout Jackson Square and as people are just partying and walking by they're stopping in their tracks and we watch people start and raise their hands start worshiping God and weeping on the streets you can go to the next slide there that's my wife at our Christmas outreach. That was our first outreach. This was a powerful outreach. We gave out 120 sleeping bags to the poor and, and the homeless so they would have a, a, a warm thing to sleep on at night. Many of the homeless end up dying every year in the French Quarter because of, of freezing conditions that are not prepared for. And so we gave um, everything from scarves, hats, gloves, um, sleeping bags, and hygiene products to them that, that day. We're doing that again December 14th. But we're doing it, uh, the bar is actually shut down for us to go in there. And, uh, and they're losing money doing it, but they're just saying, come in for free of charge and uh, do anything you want. So we have, it's a restaurant as well. So we have uh, a commercial kitchen where we can provide uh, food for the homeless there. And we can actually sit them at tables and serve them and treat them like the royalty that they are in the kingdom of God. Will you go to the next slide there? That's us with all the supplies behind us. I don't know how we fit 120 sleeping bags in our SUV, but we did it. Uh, they were vacuum sealed, so we had them all shipped. The, the Assembly of God churches bought them for us. And so we, were, we packed them tight and we drove six and a half hours or six hours into New Orleans and hand delivered these in Jackson Square. You can go to the next slide. That's inside of one of our worship services packed just recently since I've taken over inside of that bar room. Now that's an old bar room that was originally a brothel. It's a French establishment that was a brothel turned into a bar room and now it's, it's becoming a church house. <laughs> so if, if you just see the progression of the kingdom of God, I, 
I just want to remind you, church, if I haven't blown your mind already, it's nothing I've done. It's all what God has done. But if I just haven't blown your mind as far as what God can do in infiltrating darkness, there is no place safe from the presence of God. No place is safe from his presence. Marie Laveau's house of voodoo is not safe from the presence of God. Those fortune tellers are not safe from the presence of God. He will run down those set up and, and, and established in darkness. He will run and chase after the prodigal. He will run after the addict. He will find the homeless sleeping in the gutter on the street. There is no place safe from the presence of God. We want to thank you this morning, even as we're being sent out as U.S. missionaries. We want to thank you. I don't want to take up the entire time to tell you testimonies. But even this past gathering, we had someone that was demonized walk into our meeting. I didn't know they were demonized at first. Maybe that makes me less spiritual. I don't know. I just didn't know. It, it's usually a very rowdy service. Um, it's prayer and intercession. People are going after the Lord. People don't pay $30 to park their car. Um, some, most of people actually drive from out of state that come to our meetings that are Christians. And so people don't do that and not expect a touch from the Holy Spirit or to be one that is going to bring change. People are serious when they go into this place. And so we have a, uh, we'll have 50 or 60 people, uh, sometimes as many as 75 or 80 inside of that bar room. And there was this demonized woman that was brought. I had never met her before. Uh, she slipped in after worship and prayer had started, but she started screaming, no, 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 in the middle of worship. I didn't know what was going on. Next thing you know, somebody I didn't even know that was a Christian laid hands on her. The demon left, led her to the Lord, and she came up and testified. She had never experienced the presence or the freedom of the Holy Spirit before. She left. She got baptized in the Holy Spirit on the barroom floor in the middle of our prayer meeting on Bourbon Street just three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Not only that, we were praying for revival in the homeless community, and Michael, one of our homeless guys, came. He had just gone into detox. He was out for 24 hours. We got him housed with somebody so he would be chaperoned for that 24 hours before he was driven by our team and placed into rehab. He is now safely in rehab. But during that 24 hours, he stood there and as we interceded for revival in the homeless community, I looked at him and he was looking up at the sky with tears coming down his face and he began walking up to the front when I held the microphone and he said, can I share something? I want prayer this, I want prayer this evening. And so at 10 o'clock at night on Bourbon Street in an old dirty bar Room, Michael received prayer and the church gathered around him praying that God would deliver him and set him free from addiction. Not only that, when somebody heard that he was crying out for addiction, freedom from addiction, somebody else came forward and said, I'm addicted too and I need to be set free. And we prayed, lay hands on him and I, I believe that God has set them free. He's going to see them through. I know it's a process of faithfulness and accountability, but we're there for them. We're meeting them where they're at. And so so as we are called to this place, I want to thank you for partnering with us. You are an extension of what God is doing on Bourbon Street. You've been praying for revival. Well, here it is. Your seed has been sown into the ground. You've been giving faithfully in your faith promises and your missions giving. I know this is a missions church. I've talked to your pastor. I've had times with him. I've looked at your thrift store and what you do for missions and how you charge the community. I've seen what you've done. And I'm telling you, your seed in the ground is producing a harvest, not only on Bourbon street but all around the world but i believe that god is only going only getting started with what he's going to do there so thank you for investing us thank you for partnering with us thank you for being monthly partners or one-time partners with us we appreciate you thank you for lending us your ear i pray that more than anything today that you leave stirred by the presence and the person of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus, which really is the spirit of missions. That for God so loved the world, for God so loved Bourbon Street, for God so loved this community. He loved them so much that he gave his life. I just want to be one person that gives his life to telling others that Jesus loves them that much. I just want to find the Michaels. I just want to find those are the fortune tellers on the streets. And I believe that God is charging you this morning as well. I believe that you can leave here with that same imprint on your heart. Why prayer? Prayer changes everything. There is power in prayer. In a place where there are altars of the, of the enemy set up 
on every bit of that 13 block, there's more than 13 fortune tellers and voodoo practitioners practicing at any moment of the day. Those are, those are ministers of the kingdom of darkness. I know they're deceived children of God, but they're ministers of the kingdom of darkness. But I know that we're, we're, we're outnumbered. I understand that. I understand that. But I believe that we must set up a stronghold of the Lord in a place where for so long there have been strongholds of the enemy. There is power in prayer. The church was born out of a 10-day prayer meeting in Pentecost. We were charged at Pentecost and, and, and breathed on by the Holy Spirit and sent out. And, and 3,000 were added in one day. Well, imagine what could happen if Pentecost breathes on Bourbon Street or breathes on this community. There is power in the place of prayer, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Yes. Yes, amen. That, that word transformed in Greek, it's where we get the root word metamorphosis, right? We all know what that means. It's Webster defines it as a great change or appearance in character. The process causing a sudden change in the forming of habits of some mature animals during the immature stage, as such as a caterpillar to the adult stage of a butterfly. Right, we all know that. I, I'm not, not trying to teach you a, a, a little science class here, but I think that's one of the most beautiful expressions we can see, that as we're beholding Jesus and we're transformed into his image, that there is a process of beholding him and actually becoming in his image, that we're literally changed in our nature, we're changed in our characteristics, we're changed in our habits, the way we think from the inside out as we behold him. Beholding Jesus causes us to be transformed in our appearance to others in our character within, and in our habits that are out of line with our full potential that he has called us to, calling us into the beauty of Jesus, beholding Jesus. In scripture, Paul persecuted and killed Christians in Acts 9, as he was on the road to Damascus, the glory of Jesus knocks him down off of his feet, and he confesses Jesus as Lord, and he's commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles, preaching the gospel with power. Simon Peter had an encounter with Jesus in Matthew 16 that caused even his name to change as he beheld Jesus through the eyes of heaven's revelation. Jesus turns to Peter in Matthew 16, 18 and 19 and says, I tell you this, Peter. I tell you that you are Peter, excuse me, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. That word church here is ecclesia. It's a legislative assembly. Do you know it's not even a churchy term? That if you actually look at what that means, that, that it, it means selected ones. It literally translates selected ones or legislative assembly. It's not a religious term at all, but it actually was used as a political term and a governmental term used, to, used for the gathering together of those to govern the affairs of a city. Jesus used this term knowing that he would understand what it is. Come on. Jesus used this term to express that he was given keys of governmental authority to the church through Peter, through this encounter with him. It didn't come from somebody else. It came from beholding God himself. It was that direct connection he had in the place of prayer that caused him to step into this authority. Beholding Jesus and knowing him. Peter, out of beholding Jesus in this revelation from heaven, I'm giving you the legislative authority to bind and loose and govern the affairs of your city yes. and everywhere that you step foot. We are transformed by the person of Jesus. Not only his character is given to us, but also his authority is given to us. Wherever I walk on Bourbon Street... It may be Saints and Sinners Ballroom. It may be Jackson Square. It may be Royal Street. I don't care where I walk. As I walk past every fortune teller, he's given me the authority to govern the affairs of the city. That means that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. Every idol of voodoo must bend its knee. There is no place safe from the presence of God. The keys of the kingdom are in our hands. We walk and we tread upon everything that the enemy tries to erect. We walk in the authority of Christ. The place of prayer. 
causes us to aggressively lay hold of the Great Commission. Yes. In Acts 1.8, the promise of Pentecost is given to the church. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That word receive is lambano. It means to forcefully lay hold of that which rightfully belongs to you. Yes. Let me put it this way. When you go to pay for something at the grocery store and you pay with a hundred dollar bill but it's only fifty eight dollars worth of groceries, you hand that hundred dollar bill back, what do you expect the cashier to do? Give you that which is rightfully yours, right? It doesn't belong to the cashier. But that cashier is holding on to it until you take hold of it. It's not in your possession. That is what it's like in the kingdom of God. Yes. You'll receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will lambano. You will forcefully lay hold of that which rightfully belongs to you. The ones that received the promise of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost were the ones that were gathered in the place of prayer. The 120 believers who aggressively or actively pursued God in the place of prayer, believing for the promise that Jesus spoke. Church was born out of that 10 day prayer meeting and gained God's power and perspective, which cannot be rushed. Glory. It's a violent, fervent pursuit in the place of prayer. And I believe that that is why God has called us to the place of prayer on Bourbon Street. You can say, Why do I need a missionary to go and pray on Bourbon Street? We pray right here in our church. There are strongholds of the enemy set up, but I know that I am forcefully laying hold of what rightfully belongs to me to govern the affairs of that city. I am sent as, as one that is sent not on my own power, but the power of the Holy Spirit to say everything in darkness must bend its knee to the gospel of Christ. Yes. Amen. That means addiction has no authority anymore. That's right. That means voodoo has no authority anymore. I've had people uh, that were practicing Satanism lay hands on me and curse me in the name of Satan. Do you know what happened? I love sharing this testimony because I, I feel like a lot of people haven't had that experience. But if you work with people in witchcraft or you work with people in the occult, you'll probably have something like that happen at some point. Do you know what happened when they laid hands on me and cursed me in the name of Satan? I began laughing uncontrollably. I didn't mean to. The Holy Spirit bubbled up on the inside of me. And I was in ninth grade. I mean, I, I wasn't making fun of anybody. <laughs> I was a timid ninth grader, right? But the Holy Spirit bubbled up on the inside of me. And I got so drunk in the Holy Spirit. All I could do was laugh at the joy of the Lord that was coming from within me. Because greater is he that's on the inside of you than he that's in the world. And I just want to tell you, church, greater is he that's on the inside of us than he that's in Bourbon Street. Every other altar that's been laid down before the enemy, I say it must be overturned by the keys that are in my hand through the blood of Jesus that I will govern the affairs of the city he has called me to. Acts 1.8 commissions us into a place of burning prayer to receive the fullness of the promise. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's actually a, it's actually a progression of influence that you see. In Jerusalem, right there where you're at, we're right there. There may just be a few of us gathered in that bar, but that's our Jerusalem. That's where we're at. This is your Jerusalem, right where you're at. When God begins to breathe on you, he's not going to necessarily say, okay, drop everything you've got and go to a foreign land. He's going to start right where you're at. For some of you, he may do that. He may send you out. But for some of you, it's giving the boldness to begin to minister to your coworkers. It's starting in your Jerusalem. And then as you begin to steward faithfully what God has given you, as you are as you're faithful with little... You will be trained to be possessors of much. It's just how it happens. There's a progression. Okay, then go to the surrounding cities. And then it says to the ends of the earth, there is increase in the kingdom of God as we steward his presence in the faithful place of prayer and obedience. The place of prayer finally will cause others and yourself to find your God-given calling to carry the kingdom effectively. We've already been seeing this as we were some of the first fruit being commissioned on Bourbon Street, actually being sent there. Do you know there's another lady? Her name's Tara. She's one of our ministry partners with the homeless. She doesn't live in New Orleans. She lives in Kentucky. Every three weeks, 
she travels into New Orleans with a truckload of supplies with one other lady. And they go out and they hit the streets every day, morning, afternoon, and night. They only stop, and if this doesn't just, just show you the love that they have, they only stop to eat their meals and they, they get it to go. They won't even go into a restaurant. They go back to their hotel room because they have to take off their shoes because their feet are swollen up. And, I, and, I, and it's because they've been on their feet all day long and they put their feet up while they're eating so that they don't take too much time so they can go back out to the homeless. Do you know that they were commissioned in that bar room, in that serve, that worship service a few years ago? They've been doing this for years now. We've already begun seeing it. We've already been, begun seeing the first fruits. Erica and I were some of the first, few, first fruits. Derek, another homeless guy, one of the first fruits. He's one of our leaders now. He shows up to set up. He waits till everyone's gone to tear down. He goes out, even being homeless himself, and serves every week. He serves with our team to go and feed other hungry people. He has laid down his life in the place of prayer. We are seeing this where people are stepping into their God-given kingdom identity and they're being effective because they're brought into their purpose underneath the alignment of the Holy Spirit. Yes. One person in scripture, as I close, that I want to remind you of is a woman named Anna. Prophetess Anna, actually. For those of you that are called into ministry and women, as the Assemblies of God backs this, you can see that Anna actually had one of the most powerful ministries of her day. Actually, I believe that she had the most powerful ministry yes. of her day. And let me explain that to you for just a moment. Moses prophesied over the tribe of Asher in Deuteronomy 33, 25, that your strength will equal your days, which is a testament to the life of, the prof of prophetess Anna as she's about 105 years old at the time of this encounter that marks her ministry. She's the daughter of Peniel, which means face of God. I love names in scripture. How many of you know names typically mean something in the scriptures? There's a lot of names of the Lord if you haven't looked at the names of God through scripture. Peniel was derived from the same place where where Jacob received his limp after wrestling with God in Genesis 32. What a powerful picture of the life of Anna, Anna faithfully wrestling with God in the place of prayer for the redemption of Israel because that's what she gave her life to. By painting a picture for you this morning. Prophetess Anna, whose name literally translates as grace, was graced with beholding and recognizing the face of Jesus in the flesh. It was this encounter that changed her life forever. In Luke 2, 36 through 38, it says a prophetess named Anna was also in the temple court that day. She was from the Jewish tribe of Asher and the daughter of Peniel. Anna was an aged widow who had been married only seven years before her husband passed away. After she died, she chose to worship God in the temple continuously. For the past 84 years, she had been serving God with night and day prayer and fasting. While Simeon was prophesying over Mary and Joseph and the baby, Anna walked up to them and burst forth with a great chorus of praise to God for the child. And from that day forth, she told everyone in Jerusalem who was waiting for the redemption that the anticipated Messiah had come. So here is Anna later in her years of life saying, I don't have anything to offer. I'm sure she felt like that at times. Only married seven years and her husband passed away. Now she's a widow and here she is. God, I don't know what I can offer you, but I'll offer you my life in the place of prayer. I'll lay down my life for 84 years. She laid down her life in the place of prayer and intercession until one day Mary and Joseph were passing by. And they stopped in. And as they were being greeted, Anna just happened to be there praying and fasting for the redemption of Israel. Praying and fasting. Night and day, she gave her life to this thing. And there was baby Jesus, but nobody knew he was the Messiah until Anna passed by. 
And she burst forth into a prophetic song. That tongue and, and utterance that you gave, it was something similar like that. But it was a direct word from heaven that she began to sing out. This is the Messiah. This is the one that we've waited for. And from that day forward, Anna was marked. Had Anna not given her life in the place of prayer and fasting, she had suffered great loss. If I were in Anna's shoes, I might would have given up. I wouldn't blame Anna if she didn't devote herself to prayer and fasting for the rest of her life. I wouldn't blame her if she just said, I've lived a good life. It's over. I've done the best that I can. But she devoted herself. And from that day forward, it says that she went around proclaiming the message. The one that you're looking for has finally come. The Messiah has come. There is no greater message for those that are seeking redemption than Jesus Christ has come. That he is here to save and seek that which is lost. The power of prayer has Three major things that I want to point to you. It has many benefits. But number one, it gives us the authority to govern and decree a thing that is established over a territory as the ecclesia of Christ, the governing body of Christ. Number two, it causes us to aggressively lay hold of the Great Commission. And number three, prayer causes us to align with our God-given destiny and message, the one that only the Holy Spirit can breathe on us and send us out with power, that one that only comes by those that wait upon the Lord. That's where you renew your strength. There is power in the place of prayer. Don't leave here 
touch that you need this morning. That widow said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch a small, small piece, that will work for me. What about you this morning? Are you hungry for God so much in your life that you're willing to press through, to press through, to just touch even the hem of his garment. Isaiah 6 says that his train filled the temple. It filled the temple. The presence of the Lord is here. And he's able this morning to touch in your life. Jesus. Jesus. Sing that chorus, Joshua. Sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I
child of God. Yes, I am. It's free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. this morning. Lord, we praise you. Lord God, let the power of your presence be upon this couple. Lord God, upon this church. We praise you this morning for your presence. Lord, let the power of your Holy Spirit go with each and every one of us to fulfill your kingdom and the glory that you have called, Lord God, be revealed among this people we live among. In the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.